debate about race? Debate about <laughs> identities. No. Debate about identities and your... I don't know, maybe, could be. Um, I think race debate is a debate about identities. It's a debate about your place in the space. And your... Yeah. It's race debate? I think the larger portion of debate that we qualify as race debate is a debate more about identities. Race is a socially constructed concept. Well, I think they can tell you're black in your DNA. Can they? Oh, but they can. Because I thought they were, um, well, the scientific research that's behind it, there's like, there's only, like, there's 96% identical, and there's only like a 4% difference. That 4% tells you white or black. Black. Serious. 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 Right? This is usually why it is that, like, biological like what I've learned is that there's only like two races there's only like black and white so that's not necessarily true because I don't know that, that's maybe just, that's just a, examples that I use yeah I don't know maybe right that's why we have to like the term people of color because it's really hard to specify it just because you are supposed to be like caramel skin for instance how am I supposed to tell who you are that's what I just did to him and he was just like no asshole I'm <laughs> <laughs> Okay.
Okay, I do have a question though. So, <laughs> so in the previously stated um, situation of the person identifying as Mexican, what would have been an accurate identification for them to say what their race actually was? Some may be able to define themselves like I'm black in the biosystems of oppression, so you can call me a black person, I'm a brown person, a lot of people identify with that. And then there's also the answer of I don't know. Because in a conversation about race and even the scholarship about race, my identity falls somewhere in between that I can never really trace, you know? And that's why it's important to really uncover these debates because it's not really about who people are, but who they don't know they are. Right. And we can talk about that a little bit more. We will talk about that a little bit more, especially when it comes to answering these arguments. All right, so what's the history of debates about race? Why do these things exist? Well, these things exist simply because people found that it was hard for them to turn off who they were, who they had learned to be when they come into debate grounds. The traditional way of engaging debate a lot of times traded off with their ability to find something productive with it, right? Me going to a, a high school or a college, sitting in a classroom, talking about what the United States federal government could and should do has a limited benefit for me if at home I need something, I don't need to suggest somebody do something, I actually have to do something, right? Instead of going to debate practice after school, I have to go to a job because I got to pay the light bill this month because my dad can only pay the rent. You know what I'm saying? And so we started to use, we recognized the potential and the importance of debate as a pedagogical activity for younger students, but it is extremely important that we make sure that that pedagogical activity is malleable enough to meet the needs of students who will inevitably come into it with different experiences, different identities, in different perspectives. So yes, I think debate is great. But there's a lot of room to criticize how it is that we've used debate. They criticized it how it was used before. They criticized it yesterday and how I did debate, right? And I still criticize the foundations of debate. Even teams who think that they are super critical, and I think that it's important for those teams to be criticized as well. A conversation of what this place is and what it can be always has to be at the forefront of those discussions in order to understand what we're doing. Right? For instance, if you haven't laid down what how your house works, how your home situation works, then how do you come to relate to the people in that? How does it ever feel like home? You got to have a conversation with people about that. You got to have a conversation with people in there so you know where they are. Does this make sense? Yeah. particular evolved mostly out of what is going to be the Louisville project. Now let me stop and say, let me stop and say this, it's because to assume that there were not people of racial minorities inside of debate prior to the Louisville project is ignorant. Black people have been in debate. Latinos have been in debate. They have. That's just an undeniable thing. Right? But whether or not we focus on that identity and use it as part and parcel of our argument is a totally different thing. Right? We can even look at Rashad Evans, who's now seen as just like this phenomenal coach for kids like Elijah and myself, and even Corey and Amina and Demir and Miguel. But what he did was talked about capital punishment as a black man. Right? He used that as part of his argument but not in his first speeches. Because the way in which he had to present the information to a traditional, un, uh, a traditionalist understanding of debate and also to very traditional style judges was he had to, he felt as if he had to kind of, you know, lay down who he was so they can be who they were. Does that make sense? Yeah. He kind of had to give up himself in order to make sure the arguments got there. But when teams responded to talk about why his demand for the United States federal government to change its stance on capital punishment, it became very important for him to be like, no, as a black man, who a person who experienced capital punishment on a day-to-day -day basis, or at least represents those who do, it, you need to understand that the affirmative is written from a position that does actually affect who we are and what we do inside of this space, not just what the United States federal government could and should do. Follow me now.
Mm-hmm. But the turn begins with the Louisville Project. Um, I'm not going to break that all down. The question, the, the thing that you need to know is that there's there was exclusion and debate. People found that debate itself became an insular activity. Right, that to where there was a specialized lingo. Right, how many of y'all have tried to explain debate to somebody who doesn't debate? How difficult is that? Oh yeah. Right, telling them how tournaments work, and it's like, okay, listen, it's like the NBA playoffs, but like and we have like pool play at first, and then you go into the round. They don't, they don't know. Right, you ask them what a link turn is, or who? Right, <laughs> they don't know. And this is because we have a very specialized lingo to this activity. But that was Louisville's problem. Was though, why is this pedagogical liberational activity supposed to be so gated? Why is it supposed to keep people out? Why is why are we using a dialect in which everybody can understand? So they started to do a couple of things. They started to change the way in which they presented their information. Right. This includes song, poetry. Saying nothing at all. Pictures. Feel me on that? But they was like, no, 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 that's not enough. Right? But just because we change the way that we do doesn't change the way in which the space works. Right? They was like, okay, we got to do something different. So what they started doing was, before they would fly in early to debate tournaments and then go recruit people just standing on the street and ask them to come judge debate rounds. Because they felt like an, anybody... I'm not going to say the average person because that's not a thing. Is that anybody just walking around could be able to, should be able to come into a debate and understand exactly what was going on and more importantly be able to render a decision about who they thought won and lost. Is that fair enough? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And so what they did, and this is why we look back to Louisville for a lot of this, is that they not only changed what debaters did inside of the activity, they changed the fundamental dynamics of debate and how it operated. Now, God knows there was a lot of backlash from what they did. Y'all know that was true. You know what I'm saying? People were upset. These people were not qualified to debate, judge debate tournaments. But that was exactly Louisville's point. What do you mean somebody has to be qualified to judge a debate? Right? What do those qualifications entail? Because if you really want to be honest about qualifications, I don't know how many of those white people could evaluate debates about identity in general. Right, because usually that response is, I will never be able to know your position, so therefore I, I give up. I'm, I don't want to talk about that. That's why even we understand racism today to be such a taboo topic, right? You talk about racism at the table with some people you've seen as inappropriate. I mean, I don't get it, but I'll talk about whatever I want to talk about. But this is where we are in the world, and the reason why we're at that place is because we have and I think the instructor catches this word, normalized. We have normalized what it means to engage. We have normalized what it means to debate. We have normalized what is a debate. Right. That's why race debate, especially in high school, is often, unfortunate, unfortunately, often called the UDL style. Right. I don't even know what that is, because at my UDL, how I learned debate was very policy-oriented. I I still love a good state's counterplan. I know federalism is not a thing, but I will make it a thing. (laughs) That's what I learned to do first. And I still enjoy that style of debate, but it was a question of what I wanted to do with my debate career. Fair enough. So I'm going to tell you all the story of when I first got into debate. Uh, I actually told you I was a very traditional policy um, debater, and... I kind of got tricked into doing critical debate. Uh, I was in the squad room one day, and a girl from University Academy named Marshawn Thomas, I don't know if you remember her, she, was, she needed a partner. She had came to Central and was like, I need a partner. We had nobody at our school. And so my debate coach was like, sure, you can go to debate with Ryan. And so I pulled all my tubs. I had three tubs. I pulled it all into the room. I took the tops off. It was like, listen, this is what I've been doing on this topic. I have had fun. And it was the national service topic. So we had a Peace Corps app. We had a Learning Serve America app. And I was just like, we ready for anybody. We got these counter plans to stay. Like, we're really good with it. And she was just like, well, you can put all that away because I have one expendo. Um, and here are the three things you would need. It was a piece of Tim Wise evidence, a piece of Casey R. Benz evidence, and a type out of what Louisville called the three pair methodology. And she was like, you need to have a 1AC ready by tomorrow morning. Because that's when, that was the first year they had the Casey KCC TLC tournament. She was like, you need to be ready. Come to morning. I'm like, what is this? And so I took these three papers home as well because I asked her for her expendo because I wanted to be in the know. I was a ch- 
child who wanted to read everything, right? So I took it home and I was like, okay, sitting at my dining room table and I was crying because I didn't understand. I didn't know what to do. And I was just like, why are they talking about like racism in debate? I don't know why this answers the, the question of the resolution. This is like really silly to me. So we get to the tournament and we somehow or another end up being negative the first round as usual. <laughs> and she was like, oh, by the way, you're the two in. And I was like, <laughs> what? What? Yeah, she was like, yeah, I got you though, don't worry about it, I got you. And I was like, you're just in here, I'm just walking away, she was like, cool. So we get in this debate, and we're debating this team, and she does her one and see, and the way she did it, you know, it was very performatively powerful, you know what I'm saying? It was a lot of spoken word, but it was a lot of Marshana at the same time, part stuff about Marshana, even though we had been good friends for two years, stuff that I didn't even know about her, things that had happened to her inside of the debate. And so I thought I had a little bit of understanding of it because she was making it matter in the context of their Peace Corps ask about how people say they always want to go help people, and then but ain't nobody asked for help, right? And so that was the general thesis of it. And so the 2AC stands up, and he's doing his thing, and then he got, it was like, he had like a minute left, and he literally turned to her face, and was just like, that does not belong here, poetry prose is down the hall. I was like, who the hell is he talking to? And I was like, I know he didn't. And it was that moment, it was that moment that everything clicked for me. I got the blocks, I understood why she did what she did, I got a little bit of understanding of why Louisville had started to do what they did, but it took that moment for that to happen to me and my partner, for me to even get it. So as a policy debater myself, I didn't understand why it would be important or necessary for me to talk about me and other things. And that reoriented how I viewed debate. Debate no longer became just an activity where I came to have fun. Debate, for me, was activism. My goal was to change debate. I talked about debate in every single debate following that moment. Every single one. Even if the other team wasn't talking about debate. I don't care if he was talking about debate. I'm talking about debate, too, right? And I'm not saying that this is what you all need to dedicate your debate careers to, but I think it's important for you to understand how we arrived at this particular moment because some people have literally dedicated their debate, debate careers and even their lives to now to make a debate a space where all students can come and share their views, for perspectives, and opinions about any given subject, okay? So that's not only a little theoretical history. That's also some writing history, so you know who I mean. All right. Feel me? Good. Let's do some fun stuff. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, you know, I thought about, like, let's go do Wilkerson. Let's talk about, like, racist debate. But I find that the most important thing that people want to know is how do you do this? Right? How do you write affirmative perspective? How do you debate against the affirmative perspective? Right? That's stuff y'all want to know. Am I wrong about that? Right. Huh? Right. You want to know? Okay. Well, I'm going to give y'all my formula. And obviously, this is critical alternative style debate. So I'm pretty sure you have several different formulas. But here's my four steps for writing any argument, whether it be affirmative or negative. The first question that you have to answer is what does the topic mean to me? Seems pretty simple, huh? force you to do. Don't you have to figure out what the topic is? Right? This is what I said. This is for an app or a name position, right? You have to figure out what topic you're writing this for. Right? Can that topic be yourself? Yeah, what do I mean to me? Right? But it also it forces you to answer a
So that you can relate to the topic, sure. But why is the question of who am I? Is it relevant for how the argument should um, make itself into the debate space and how the debate space relates to what you want to say in that space? A little bit, but not really. couple of things that you need to do. The purpose of this question is to try to, first of which is to answer the question of Or do, do we even care about that? Is it core bodies? Is it women? Is it the other in a more abstract theoretical sense? Is it alterity as just a philosophical concept? Right? You have to provide some information about that, right? And it's important for you to explore that in the developmental stages of it, right? Because if you lose grasp of what your topic is, you're automatically going to not only in the debate, but even in your preparation of the argument. How many times did you either sat down to write a paper and you was just writing? And next thing you know, whatever you wrote was totally not what you planned for it to be. Right? Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's a terrible thing. But for debate, we always want to make sure that we stay focused on what it is, whatever it is that we're arguing, especially in regards to creating an argument that is performative or alternative to some shape, form, or fashion. Okay. The second reason I'm going to put it on the side over here is because you always want to make sure that there's a relationship between the topic and yourself, that those things kind of constitute one another. It's not only what I think about ocean exploration. 
exploration, but what does ocean exploration think about my body? How has it historically been situated? How has my body been historically situated in the context of ocean exploration, right? How my ancestors' bodies probably, or my probably, I don't know. I would assume that they were shipped across. I have no idea where I'm from, right? But that's part of my argument about the ocean. That's my relationship to the ocean that is presumed almost to a sense that that's where my ancestors came from, but how would I ever know, right? It's always that mysterious thing, right? So now we're unpacking not only the ocean, but the dual relationship and the interdependent relationship of the subject, which is usually yourself, and the object, or the other subject, right? Because you might be a subject studying subject. Any questions about this? Where? No. Kind of. Kind of. I'll give, I'll give it to you. Why do they? Why do they? Why? Not where. the 
an eight minute speech. How do you make it an ass? How do you make it a, a negative argument? What is the story to it? That's where style, identity, all that becomes extremely important. It's been important since, since the get go. But how do I put that all together? Because sure, you might have an eight minute speech that's like the best thing to you. But you read it to somebody else and they like, what was that? I don't, I don't even know what you're trying to get at. Right? So it's not only a question of how do you make it relatable to other people, but how do you make it all come together? How is this an argument? What does the construction of it look like? What is the process by which I construct it? And what is the way in which I will present it, deploy it. Do we understand this? I want to use an example. See if we can quickly try to, try to write an argument. Sure. Real quick. So who is me? You want to be me? Sure. Who are you? I'm Darian. Um, That's wonderful. Right. I'm a black man. I work okay. full time. And I really like debate. Do you? Yeah. Do you love debate? I do. Great. So what, are, what is the topic? What is the ocean community? The ocean is a place that I don't see a whole lot. That apparently people are presumed, people that look like me are presumed to have cro traveled across it. But I don't know a whole lot about it. I think it's maybe a way for like capitalism to go forward. I don't really see how it affects my life that much. Um I guess to this topic I'd just be another person arguing about it. Maybe a voter Yeah. Hmm. Are you saying no special connection or you don't feel like you're anyone? So it's not a unique perspective on it? I feel like ocean exploration and or development. What do they think about you? Or what do you think it what do you mean to it? I'd say that in this topic I mean nothing to it. She seems to have an idea.
I think it's I think it's pretty accurate. Well, I think debate because it's a place where I can find out really what oceans mean to me and also explore whether or not ocean development is a good thing to undertake from my position as an individual within this topic. I, I can try. I think you'll probably have a better articulation, but I think it's probably something like I'm a person from a specific position, right? And the topic itself probably doesn't care very much about me, and I don't know exactly what the topic does for people like me, but I think debate is a space where I can figure those questions out, and that's important to learn. Um, 
It's a good affirmative because it allows me to answer some very important questions about myself and about the community as a whole. What does that do for the name? You didn't defend the United States federal government action. The negative still gets the ability to explore what oceans really mean to other bodies and to their body. Right, so you've changed the scope of debate to where we would ask different questions that we wouldn't get out of a traditional understanding of the resolution. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> um, it would probably be like the affirmative doesn't have an understanding of how oceans affected my body or their body, and that is a presupposition to OTEC and their warming advantage. Can you please just unpack it just a little more? Right, and so I'm what I mean by reading into the resolution is not decide what the resolution asks for you to do. Usually people think that the resolution is something that you say yes or no to. Should the United States federal government substantially increase its ocean exploration and or development? The app usually, in a traditional sense, says yes to that question, whereas the negative says no to that question, right? But we would like to think about debate that this is not a, a question that the resolution is posing. It is a prompt for us to go and do more exploration. So yes, the resolution is a starting point, but it does not necessitate it be the end point. This is the difference between a topical discussion and a discussion about the topic. A topical discussion would just say yes or no to the resolution, whereas a discussion about the topic uses the topic as the prompt to get to further knowledge and argumentation. How 
does somebody who fits with, uh, I'm sorry, now this is more of an answer to your question rather than. It's fine. How, how does somebody who fits within the, who falls within, like, say, the category of, like, the standard that creates, like, the, like, elitist slash exclusionary mindset of, of debate, i.e., like, thinking policy best only forum, how do their arguments interact with, how can they interact with this framework, I guess is my question. Several different ways. First, the way in which it interacts is the framing level of what the question is supposed to be. What I just talked about, uh, like a topical discussion versus a discussion of the topic, right? A lot of people would say, oh, well, we think people should stop running framework. Well, I don't know if that's what I would say. I think that people should be less exclusionary. I think that arguments about like why you shouldn't do he this here, right? And so usually how a framework is interpreted is like A interpretation, B violation, C standards. D is the voter which says that you should vote negative because the 1AC should have never even happened in the first place. I think that's a ridiculous argument. However, a debate about what this debate should be about is important. The negotiation of rules, the negotiation of terms is absolutely important to that discussion. Right? Say, for instance, we agree on the terms, though. We should be able to question whether or not affirming debate as a site of exploration is good. Right? We should not probably explore with debate. Because debate is dangerous. Debate falls prey to the same history of exploration that this, even this country does. You know? And so, teams can engage this question of whether or not the app should affirm debate as a site of exploration. You can even go to use arguments about ocean exploration and how it's been manifested as a reason as to why affirming it in debate would be problematic. And also, whatever you thought of on the topic, right? And this is why I don't, a lot of teams think that if they read their app, like, Say, for instance, affirm debate as a, a site of exploration was my affirmative. And the negative team said that we should use OTEC as a way to solve warming because policy discussions are good. What permutation do I get? A lot of times people are scared of that debate because they're like, well, the app confirms that they're not competitive. They're directly competitive, right? Because not only do we have an implicit discussion about what the framing should be, but you have su suggested and functionally performed a whole different advocacy than the affirmative has. And so have you have fundamentally engaged the question of what it means to have a site of exploration. We have explored oceans and the available technology to solve warming where you have explored the place and space of debate. You don't get no damn permutation. What are you permitting? Because you didn't do it. Remember, do both. You have to do in order to get the poll. And that's not something that happens a lot of times. Does that help to answer your question? Yeah. And so I guess I think that there's a multiplicity of things that teams can do to engage, right? But I don't think that it's good to like normalize that. For instance, I had a team on the democracy topic. We read a hip-hop app that supported cultural democracy assistance because, I don't know, a lot of if y'all know about this, the history of how we understood about the revolutions in the Arab Spring was because of things like YouTube videos, right? People were getting on their phones, sending them out. So my partner and I decided it would be good if we responded to that by talking about, hey, there's some exclusion debate the same. It's not the same stuff you're talking about, but we can relate. And we put that up on YouTube, right, and shared it with people. The negative read a politics argument that says that the staff was going to backlash, right? Because the plan supported the production or the export, sorry, the exportation of yeah, the exportation of democracy assistance. And so their argument was that the staff is already on the brink right now, and so they're going to crack down against the people, right? Sure, in the one and C, it probably didn't sound that relevant, but as the debate developed, their argument was like, but if you're right that your app really does provide cultural com uh, cultural assistance, cultural connection to those people, then why wouldn't it be understandable for you to not 
think that somebody else was going to see that video to see that you've been having secret conversations and go and knock on those people's doors, whoever viewed the video, and murder them. We've directly engaged your argument. I have a question about the beginning, right? So, like, this um, why debate part. 
what does the ballot do in the world of the affirmative, right? So, like... That's it, up to the affirmative. Right. In a lot of these things, so, for instance, uh, and we can use yours, for example, uh, explore the main for personal understanding, right? Mm-hmm. Is the goal to solve X impact? The goal of the affirmative really is not even to solve, but rather to reveal. Um, so with that being said, then why would the AF necessarily have to win the round in order to, i.e., like, discover themselves or explore debate right, as a whole? Right, that's what I'm getting at, is yeah. that the goal of the AF this, this time is not a question of solving, but a question of revealing. Now, they will then strategically make arguments about why the negative precludes a revealing, which is why they should win. Right. Impacts are totally evaluated differently. The debate is not about how does X solve X impact, but rather how do we deal with that? What is the methods for coping with that? What is the purpose of debate? The purpose of debate in this affirmative would be to explore, to be the site of exploration where we affirm knowledge is for all students. And so it's not seeking to use the United States federal government to solve extinction. The frame of which you have to look at not only the affirmative and the debate as a whole, but even more importantly, the judge and the ballot has to change. Right? And so when we engage in critical debate, we always have to be critical of everything that we think we know already about debate. Right? A lot of times people criticize us like, you don't bring students into debate. Like, there's no students that debate as a result of what you and your partner do, well, A, that's a lie. But B, that's not the goal of what our app seeks to do. Our app is not to literally go grab the hands of minority children and bring them in the conversation. Actually, that's the exact opposite. We seek to make debate better in order for when they do get here, not to be excluded. Yeah. Um, one more question. Like, touching on this kind of, like, critical pedagogy within the debate space, right? So how does, like, the AF almost win, like, a spillover argument, right? Yeah. Because a lot of times, like, the negative team will argue, like, outside of this round, it really doesn't matter. So right. that's a big debate to be had, right? It's whether or not what we do outside of the debate or things outside of the four walls of debate matters. The affirmative might even say things outside of those four walls matter. Right? And the negative may be the team that says only in round impacts matter. And so that's a debate that has to be hashed out. Right? You have to do some comparative work there. For instance, if we don't address the system of capital, every conversation that we have in the context of debate will be commodified because it is fueled, uh, well, it is sponsored by the university, which is fueled by the system of capital. Right? Whereas the other team can argue, well, if these conversations itself are not anti 